Okay, welcome back. In the previous lecture, we we introduced some some important concepts, and we use them to uh, address the problem of understanding the structure and the kinetics of transitions uh, from a given zone of uh, uh, configuration space or phase space that we identify with the reactant and a given product. And we immediately specialize to the case in which this is a rare event and therefore the system remains an exponentially long time confined in the reactant before attempting to reach a state P where it stays again more exponentially long times. And the idea was to introduce stochastic descriptors that play the role of the Boltzmann distribution in equilibrium dynamics, but rather than being based on a general ensemble of configurations that directly relates to an ergodic trajectory through the ergodic assumptions, we define an ensemble of transition pathways and use the ergodic assumption to identify time average performed only over reactive part of these ergodic trajectories to phase space distributions. And we, by doing this, we define three stochastic descriptors, the forward commuter function uh, or the backward commuter functions. If we are in a Markovian setting, uh, two commuter functions are redundant. You can use the first and then relate the other by one minus the first. The transition path density and the transition path current. And this is a scalar and this is a three-dimensional vector. So you can, if you, if you like analogy, you can see uh, some analogy with electrodynamics where you have a scalar potential and a vector potential. And once you have defined all that, you have all the information about electrodynamics fields you want. In this case, you have a scalar distribution and a vector distribution. Although uh, the vector distribution is actually in three n-dimensional space rather than just a three-dimensional space. Uh, but defining this distribution is important to set the stage, but it's not physically useful unless we can provide a way to combine this distribution and relate them to the fundamental parameters and, and in physical inputs that define the model. So basically we need a way to relate these three objects to the diffusion constant or constants if the particles have different diffusion constants, the temperature or here I write the inverse thermal energy beta and the potential energy surface. So that's what you do when you define the Boltzmann density, for instance. You don't have a diffusion coefficient in the case of equilibrium because the system is at equilibrium, there is no time scale, and the diffusion has an intrinsic time dimension, centimeter squared divided by time in GZS units. But you do have beta and u, and you define a Boltzmann distribution through that. So the goal of today is actually do the same for this three stochastic description. And we will discover something quite amazing, uh, that there are some interesting symmetries between equilibrium and non-equilibrium processes when you define these non-equilibrium reactive processes through the ergodic assumptions as in transition path theory. So we begin now this journey by first looking at the equation that is obeyed by the forward commuter function. So in other words, we want to show that the forward commuter function plays a role that is uh, symmetric in some sense with respect to the Boltzmann distribution. And to be more specific, we're going to prove that Q plus satisfies the following problem, is the solution of the following problem, is a static or zero mode of the backward Fokker Planck operator, or say the difference, the adjoint of the Fokker Planck operator, or even more, you can claim this by saying that is the left eigenstate of the Fokker Planck operator with zero eigenvalue, so it's a zero mode. But in addition to that, it obeys boundary condition. There are eight. So Q plus is the solution of this problem. Now, 
when it comes to the last two requests, you can physically motivate them very simply. You have a reactant, you have a product, and you really want Q plus to become zero when you enter the reactant, because the probability of entering the reactant before the product, if you are at the reactant, is obviously one, therefore Q minus is one, therefore Q plus is zero. Conversely, the probability of entering the product before the reactant, when you are becoming closer and closer and closer to the product, becomes closer and closer to one. So there is really nothing to prove concerning the last two sentences. What is far less trivial is to show that Q plus obeys the partial differential equation that is precisely the zero eigenmode of the backward Poker-Planck operator. And in order to see that, so stated differently, what that's actually that actually is meaning is that Q plus obeys the equation this partial differential equation. This is the adjoint operator of the focal plank operator. You can check by explicitly constructing the adjoint of the operator. How do you construct the adjoint of the operator? If you're not familiar with this, you have an operator and you have a test function, maybe two test functions, let's say phi1 and phi2. And the way this is defined in terms of an inner product, And what you actually want to do is to integrate by part to take this on the other side and set it equal to this. So if you can find the operator that does this, then you'll find the adjoint. But in order to do that, basically, when you have a differential operator, all you do is really acting by differentiation by part. And in the very structure of the focal plug operator, then you discover that. It very much depends on what kind of a definition of inner product you have. What is the structure of the adjoint? Because if your measure in the inner product contains a Boltzmann factor or not, the focal plug becomes self-adjoint or, or doesn't become self-adjoint. So I encourage you to try to, to work out this. If you cannot do that, ask me a question and I will provide a proof that this is in fact the adjoint of the focal plug operator. But give it a try yourself with this hint. It will help you understand that you are or you are not following up with these concepts. Okay, so now let's go back to our main task. Our main task is to show that the committer obeys that equation. And in order to do that, we need to make a, a small digression. And we have to say to make a corollary, if you want. on first passage time distribution. So let's suppose we want to address a slightly different problem. Forget about the commuter for a moment. We'll get back to that uh, in momentarily. But, but at the moment, let's, let's stick to a slightly different problem. And the problem is, we have a particle obeying some Langevin equation, and we stick to the alpha dump Langevin equation, as usual. We have a region of configuration space surrounded by a surface, hypersurface, partial W, and W is the region of configuration space. And so was, we want to address the following question. What is, what is the distribution of times it takes a particle that starts at x for first crossing w? So we want to find the time, the probability that a particle initiating its dynamic at x 
crosses the surface of W for the first time at some time t. So we want to find it called first time passage distribution f of t. First passage time distribution. Notice, and I need to emphasize, that I'm not interested in the probability of being at the border of the probability of the region W at time t. Because if I only was asking what is the probability that I am at the border at time t, then all I have to compute is the Fokker-Planck probability and integrate that over the border. Oh, right? Or into a thin layer here around the border. But that's not, but this kind of evaluation will account also for processes that maybe have entered the region before, they just happen to be there as we stop the clock. But we don't want this process to be included in our statistics. Our problem is, what is the first passage time distribution? The probability that my particle crosses the hypersurface surrounding this region of configuration space for the first time at time t. So in order to do that, our tool is, is something different. We need to introduce different Green's function. So if p x t x naught is the usual Green's function's probability of being at x at time t condition to start from x naught. Now we introduce a slightly different object which is assumed to obey the same partial differential equation but with different boundary condition, and I call it p star w, and that is the probability of being at x at time t, condition to start from x naught, and have never entered W at all. So this is W, this is X naught, and this is X. So clearly, if X is at the border of W or inside W, this probability is zero because the condition to have never entered W would be violated and the probability would just be zero. Density, probability density. So both of them are probability density, by the way. I should now I think by this time it should be clear. So this is a standard diffusive dynamics, which means that the this two Green's function will obey will be the Green's function of the same differential operator but they will have different boundary values. And in particular, WP, PW, P star W, is zero everywhere on W, including its border. So this is a situation, now this is, this is uh, not quite a small request you're making. The solution may change substantially. And we have experience with that when you look at electrostatic problems, right? You, you, if, you, if you take, you have a sphere, and you want, you know, this is a dielectric sphere, and you want to know the electric field everywhere, then you have a solution. But if you additionally request that that sphere is a conductor, then you have a certain request that the potential must be zero on the surface of the conductor. Sorry, must be constant on the surface of the conductor. And this changes completely the solution, right? I mean, the field changes completely. You have orthogonal field lines or whatnot. And, uh, and in fact, the way you, if you remember the way you impose the boundary conditions, if the system is sufficiently simple and symmetric, is through imaginary charges, right? 
so that you can cancel the contribution exactly on the surface. Similarly, uh, if you look at diffusion problems, the diffusion problem, uh, purely diffusion problems, forget for a moment that are you, uh, purely diffusion problems are Poisson equations. And so when you look at the pro conditional probability of first touching surface, you one standard mathematical way to do that in 3D is by imaginary charges. You, you map the problem into an electrostatic problem and then you put their imaginary charges and although the mathematics is taken from the electrostatic problem, you use it to solve diffusion. But that's not exactly what we want to do here. We will not use imaginary charges uh, because uh, uh, because we don't have a, a symmetric problem like an infinite plane or whatever. We have a generic problem. So, so P star and P obey the same differential equation, the Fokker-Planck equation, but with one fundamental difference. They have a different boundary condition. If I were to write this from the point of view of path integral, what I can do is to provide an explicit solution. That's my usual u of x plus p and half u x i. And then I have integral from x i to x f. Then I have my delta q e to the minus s on zagam x effective. And then I have an integral over some function that is not readable here. Let me just move this piece outside the way. That's it. And omega is a function that is zero outside w as an infinite in w. Now, when I say infinite, I mean very large compared to everything else. So, whenever a path happens to find, to, to get an arbitrary small portion of it touching the surface of Barview or even enter it, this guy will get terribly upset and will kill the statistical weight of that path. That path will not contribute to P star, and therefore P star will be different from having or not having this term here. So you see how the boundary values, the absorbing boundary conditions, this is called an absorbing boundary condition. is uh, formulated in terms of path integration. Now, the next step towards computing the first passage time distribution is defining the survival probability. The survival probability associated with the border of my surface T and the star starting position Xi is defined as follows. Integral over all space of P star W X T Xi. What is this? This is the probability of not having touched W yet at time T. It's called survival because when the particle touches the, the, on a path, the border of W, then that path is killed, right? It's like if the particle was taken away from the system and killed, annihilated. So this is the probability of not being annihilated yet at time t as a result of not having touched the, the border of that type of surface of that uh, region of configuration space yet at time t. Now clearly, it is made immediate to see that the survival probability is related to the first passage time distribution. How? Well, the survival probability is one minus the probability of having touched the wall at any time until t, right? The probability of not having touched the wall w yet at time t is 1 minus the probability of having touched that wall before time t, at any of the time before t. So this is really 1 minus the integral from 0 to t dt prime of f w t 
empty exile. But then, basically we are done, because all I have to do is now to take the derivative of this guy with respect to time. And if I take that, that is in fact f w t starting from xi. So the first passage time distribution is, is nothing but the time derivative, the partial time derivative of the survival probability. But then, but then I'm a, I can use that to get a very nice expression, f of w, t, xi, is equal to, well, d by dt of 1 minus s, that's minus d by dt of s. That's equal. Now, I remember that I can write the survival probability as the integral of the p star distribution so i can write this as negative of integral in x of d by dt p star w in x t condition in xi and now the next step is i have the time derivative but i know that p stars obey the same focke planck equation as p so I can use the Fokker-Planck equation here. Mm -hmm. So I can write that this is equal to negative d integral dx gradient, or better, divergence of the vector p star w plus beta grad u p star. I'm using the continuity. This is the, the Fokker-Planck current. Right? This is the current associated negative d. Let me highlight it. Negative d times this is actually the current constructed, the Fokker Planck current constructed not out of the p conditional probability, but out of the p star w conditional probability. So let's call this j star w current. So we have that the first passage time distribution is a volume integral of the divergence of a Fokker Planck current. And then I use Gauss theorem for a divergence and I relate this to a flux. So my final result is that this is nothing but the flux evaluated on the surface. of the region W of my Fokker Planck current with the boundary conditions. So we discover something quite interesting. Even though the probability vanishes P star at the border, the derivatives of the probabilities don't. So this will obviously not contribute at the border because the star vanishes at the border. But the gradient of the probability will not vanish at the border, so there will be a final steepness there. And therefore, the result is that I have a flux. And physically it makes sense. The probability is, is basically the flux of particle that land for the first time at surface W at time T starting from XI. Okay, this was our prologue, our premise, if you want. And with these ideas in mind, we can now move ahead and address the problem of what is the equation of beta by the commuter function. Now, the commuter function q of x, or q plus of x, well, if you think about it, what do we want from the commission function? We want the commuter function to be 
Essentially, the probability of landing for the first time, landing starting from X, arrive for the first time in the product without having touched the reactant. So it's basically a first passage time distribution integrated over all times. We don't care at which time it does it. We only want to know, it's basically by itself a survival probability, but with an additional request of never having entered the reactant as well. So basically what I'm saying is that I'm writing this with the, now let me take this notation a little bit simpler. I have an integral. I'm integrating for all times. I'm now doing a flux over the surface of the product of a star, but where W, where W is the region that comprises reactant and product. So in other words, I'm putting absorbing boundary condition on the product, but on the reactant too. So if my path that starts from X will happen to touch the reactant before going to P, it will not contribute to this. On the other hand, if it will touch P at some time T, it will contribute, and I will do that for any other time. And if I sum them up, I have precisely implemented what I I expect the committer to mean the probability to land in P before having landed in R. And then, in order to show what is the equation obeyed by this, then all I have to do is to, to verb something very similar to, 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 to the definition that we did before. Of the first passage time distribution. Let me let me remind you that given a probability distribution x t, say x prime t x, well we know that this is this equation is a is a solution of a Kolmogorov equation of a Fokker Planck equation when it's applied on the right hand side of x prime. When the derivatives and the forces are evaluated at x prime, but if you if you perform a spectral decomposition, you remember what enters here are the left eigenstates, right? Because remember this was expressed like right eigenstates of x prime, left eigenstates of x e to the negative lambda m t, which simply tells us that here. The same equation is actually also a solution of a slightly different Fokker-Planck equation. Now, on the adjoint. So, in fact, this is a solution of this when this is acting on derivative of x, not on x prime. So, when you act on this term, right? So, and this time is actually T naught. Right. So if you if you now remember that if you translate T minus T naught equal to some tau, then you can think about this as to be related to the derivative with respect to T. So if I I can do the following change variable, and that's a positive derivative with respect to t, right? I'm just you know changing variable from t to t naught when I do d by dt is negative d by t. Oh, sorry. 
So let me repeat this. I didn't notice that this wasn't readable. The backward Fokker Planck equation was negative T naught of P. But now I remember that T minus T naught is some kind of tau, right? The time interval here. And so when I took it in the differential with respect to T, I get a negative signs relative to the differential with respect to T naught. So I can write this as plus D by T. Okay, so now with these ideas in mind, applying this definition here, we, we are basically at home. What if you apply the, the joint of the Fokker Planck operator of the commuter function Q plus? And if you do it, then you have a, a joint integral dt, zero infinity. Then I have uh, dp, d sigma prime, j dw star. And then uh, once you do that, You can easily realize that this is now, this is the backward propagator. It acts on the right hand side here, you see? This is on the x variable, x enters in the condition, so I can propagate this through here, and basically I get now a time derivative there. So let me do this explicitly, zero infinity, dp, now, this is untouched by the each adjoint operator because this is the right argument of the conditional probability. And then I have backward or a joint Fokker Planck propagator that acts on x, not x prime, but x here on p star dw. There's x prime, t, and x, right? Now this will become dt, dt, p star. So I get integral dt, partial derivative with respect to t, zero infinity, and then I have dp, d star prime, grade prime plus beta grade u x prime p star dw x prime t x which is basically after all the, have we done all this what we discover is that the joint Fokker Planck operator acting on Q is nothing but the first passage time distribution at infinity minus the first passage distribution at zero because of the corollary that I was referring to. So, as you can see, I have now a simple equation that tells me what happens if I apply the adjoint first passage, uh, the adjoint uh, Fokker Planck operator on my commuter function. But now physics comes at handy because it says, what is the, if my system is ergodic, what is the probability that I touch my product only at infinity? If it means that I, what is the probability that I have never touched it at any time, unless I really wait an infinite amount of time? Then clearly, this is the, if you want, the definition of ergodicity. It is zero if the probability, if the system is ergodic, because the system is ergodic, it means that if I wait a long but finite time, I will get anywhere in configuration space. So this is zero. On the other hand, if x is not at the border of the product, the probability that I make it to the product at in the, for the first time in zero time is zero, too. So I get 0 minus 0, and that's 0. So 
we have now shown that the backward Kolmogorov equation, or if you want, the adjoint Fokker Planck equation, the stationary version of it provides uh, the partial differential equation which is available. So there's an interesting symmetry here. Just as the Boltzmann distribution, which is a probability distribution, not a probability, is the zero mode of the right Fokker Planck operator, the commuter function is the zero mode of the left Fokker Planck operator, provided you additionally request the boundary condition. So clearly there is some specific uh, important prominent role of the commuter function in, 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 in dynamics, right? Because it's, after all it's the solution of a fundamental equation of the system. And in fact we will see in the next lecture that the other stochastic descriptor can be expressed in terms of equilibrium properties, in terms of Boltzmann distributions, times a function of the commuter only. So in other words, if you add the commuter, the knowledge of the commuter, to an equilibrium problem, you have enough physics to understand reactive problems that are dynamics. So if you want, is the least ingredient you need to extend from thermal averages to dynamical processes. That's one fundamental process problem of the property of the commuter. And we can immediately see that there is a, another property uh, but we will come back to that next lecture. In the next lecture, we will discover that Q plus is also an ideal reaction coordinate. But before I can do that, I have to tell you what is a reaction coordinate, before I can tell you it's an ideal reaction coordinate. So in order to do that, we'll have to wait for the next lecture. That's it for now. Thank you.